Hey, church family, welcome back to another edition of the Ten Commandments. Uh, as we unpack the Ten Commandments today, I'm actually out of town. I'll be preaching uh, for a church uh, in Houston. Their pastor is on sabbatical, and uh, he's a friend of mine, and I'm helping him out and uh, pinch hitting for him. And so pinch hitting for me today is one of our very own. Uh, Pastor Stephen Courtney was uh, over connections and formation for many years here at Timber Creek. His wife Ellie is in our next gen department. Uh, pastor Stephen stepped out of the campus pastor position at the Lufkin location uh, a, a, a couple years ago to pursue becoming a missionary to pastors. Uh, he'll tell you more about that in just a minute. But I just want you to know, um, when I think of a friend, when I think of a co-laborer in Christ, when I think of somebody that truly has my back, I think of Stephen Courtney. He is a friend, he's a follower of Jesus, he loves the Lord, he loves you, he loves his family well, he's an incredible dad, and he is reaching and helping so many pastors across the nation, it's unreal. He'll tell you more about that as we also unpack this week's commandment. In the meantime, all locations, broadcast location, will you help welcome to the stage Pastor Stephen Courtney. Well, good morning, Timber Creek. How are you doing? Man, I wanna say hi to you guys. It's so good to be with family. Good to be home this, this weekend with you and an honor to get to share with you this morning. If I've not had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I know a lot of you, but if I've not met you before, it's, it's so good to meet you and so good to be here. As Pastor said, I wanna give you a, just a quick update. Two years ago, took a, a step of faith, jumped off the cliff a little bit, off the mountain cliff, and uh, stepped out in faith to do this ministry and join an incredible ministry called Standing Stone Ministry. And let me tell you something, um, you know, pastors and ministry leaders, they serve great people like you all week long, and they love people, but a lot of times they don't have someone in their life to care for them. They care for people, but they don't always necessarily have someone that cares for them and walks with them and takes time to just listen and, and spend some time with them. And that's exactly what Standing Stone Ministry gets to provide to pastors and ministry leaders. And uh, I've got a few stats that we're just gonna show up on the screen here. Um, those are not good stats. Um, but Standing Stone Ministry, we're trying to make a dent in some of those statistics and seeing those numbers go down. One that's not up there that I just heard literally in the last couple days is that a lot of pastors and ministry leaders that start ministry, after five years, only 50% of them uh, are still in ministry. They're still serving as pastors or ministry leaders. And we wanna make a difference in that. And you're making a difference in that by supporting, just like Pastor Dan said in, in the video about going on those missions trips, because of your kindness, because of this church's generosity, and many, many others, I'm able to provide a free and trusted confidential relationship to over 30 pastors every single month. Um, Standing Stone as a whole, we're reaching over 2,800 pastors and ministry leaders every single month. Um, and, and around the world, around the country, and it's because of this great church and so many others that give that we're able to do that. So thank you so much. Um, we're able to provide, uh, we're able to be present with them. That's how we do it. We're present with pastors and ministry leaders. We, we're preventative, we're personal, we're proactive. And, and, and thank you so much for playing a role in that and allowing me the opportunity to do that and provide care for pastors and ministry leaders. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's just a quick update on Standing Stone Ministry. But I'm also here today to continue in this great series. How many of you enjoyed this Ten, uh, Ten Commandments series that we've been in? It's been really good, hasn't it? As always, Pastor Jeremy just does an incredible job and, uh, and hits it out of the park every single Sunday. And uh, I get the uh, privilege of jumping into commandment number four this week. And we're gonna jump right in, right here in Lufkin at all of our locations this morning. Just excited to be able to share from God's word. And we're gonna go right to Exodus chapter 20, verses, verse eight. We're gonna read verses eight through 11, but just verse eight, I'd love to, to, uh, for you to read with me right here in Lufkin and in Nacogdoches and Mount Enterprise and Groves. We wanna hear you guys read it with us just as we've done every week. It's gonna be right here on the screen. Let's read verse eight together from Exodus chapter 20. It says this, remember, oh, we can do better than that. We can do better than that, Lufkin. Let's start over. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Sabbath, what in the world is that? Um, what in the world is that? We're gonna talk about that today. And basically, 
Sabbath in one word is to slow down. Would anybody like to just slow down life a little bit? We're gonna talk about that. But let me, you don't have to repeat with me, but I'm gonna read the other verses here, nine through 11. It goes on to say in Exodus 20, you have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest, right? Dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters. Any teenagers wanna say amen to that? Right, you're, you're nudging mom and dad saying, did you, did you catch that? That's the word of God right there that says I don't need to work on that day. Um, your male and female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy, Sabbath. What in the world? Well, some of you, if you've grown up in church, you've been in church for a few years, maybe you, maybe you have a good grasp of this word Sabbath and what that practice looks like, what it means. Um, and maybe you, you even practice it like scripture explains to us and how it's intended to be practiced and how it's intended to be lived out and fleshed out every seven, every seven days. Some of you, like myself, maybe grew up in church and you've heard that word Sabbath and you just kind of, you figured it was Sunday, right? Sabbath is Sunday, we go to church, and we just kind of relax the rest of the day, and that's kind of what we do, that's what Sabbath is. But, but for some of you across our campuses, maybe Sabbath, you're hearing that for the first time of your day, and you're like, man, that's the first time I'm hearing this. I don't know what that means and what it is. And what, what is God wanting to us to hear today is that's right smack dab in the middle of the Ten Commandments. And I want to tell you this morning that there's, way more to this ancient practice than I think we realize sometimes. And there's such a blessing, and really it is a gift from God when we practice it the way it was intended. And so we're gonna unpack that this morning. And so, but first I've gotta start with some good news and some bad news, is that okay? I'm gonna start with the not so good news. Is that okay? No, I'm gonna do it anyway. Okay, so here we go. Americans, are working more than ever before. And everybody's like, yeah, no kidding, right? Um, the Gallup, a Gallup poll recently um, found this out, that the average work week in the U.S. has gone up from 41 hours a week to 47 hours a week, which isn't that bad, I guess, except that we're spending 37% less time resting, right? Resting physically, mentally, emotionally. Some of you are like, man, I'm working 50 plus hours a week. A lot of the pastors that I work with uh, are working 50, 60 hours a week, and it's affecting them in lots of negative ways. There can be many reasons for this, but one reason I think is very clear, it's technology, right? I don't wanna sound like the old guy here, but technology, while technology has brought many uh, incredible advancements to our life, to our world, I mean, I'm right here you know, speaking from an iPad this morning. Uh, we, we love technology. It's, all the advancements have been incredible. They've been great. Our phones, our, all these different things, they've been great, but they've also created this digital distraction in our life. And really, let's be honest, they've, they've created a digital addiction for a lot of us. Let's be honest. I mean, our phones have been, become an extension of our hand, an extension of, of, of us, and they are with us constantly. They're right by our bed and, and dinging throughout the night with notifications. We, we have it as soon as we go to sleep. We have it as soon as we wake up in the morning, and these so-called labor-saving devices really have turned into labor-enabling devices. There was a time not too long ago when you would have to go to the office or go to the work site to do work, right, and to be at work. Now all you have to do is reach over and grab your phone or your device and send a quick text to a coworker while you're sitting at the dinner table with your family. And then after dinner, you can turn on the sport, turn on Sports Center, and you can catch up on emails while you're catching up on the scores. And it's so easy to get sucked into doing work in the evenings and on the weekends, because there's really no natural boundaries anymore between office and home, and between work and family. And it is affecting us. It is affecting the family. It's affecting us. So. No wonder there's a statistic by a Gallup poll that says three out of five adults in America feel more tired than they've ever felt before. Anybody feel tired this morning? Um, just me? Um, but hey, 
at least we're making money, right? We're making more money, and if we're making more money, we got more stuff, yeah? Did you know that Americans make up 22% of the global economy? And that's really good when you consider that we only make up 4% of the world's population. And we have so much stuff that sometimes we have to build a second home just because we can't fit all our stuff in the first home. It's pretty wild. Storage facilities are a $38 billion industry, right? Can you imagine what we could do with $38 billion? The dent we could make in some of the world's issues and problems, and we spend that much money on storage facilities, right? Um, there's approximately 50,000 such facilities in the U.S. with a combined storage capacity of 2.3 billion square feet. Maybe you've done a couple uh, of garage sales recently trying to get rid of some of that stuff. We, we helped some good friends of ours move uh, yesterday and they were moving in and they were like, man, we got so much stuff. And I said, well, don't listen to my message tomorrow, okay? Um, we just got a lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff. So why are we working so hard? Why are we buying so much more stuff? Well, it's because we wanna be happy, right? We wanna be happy. We have bought into this American dream idea that if you work hard, you make more money, you get more stuff, and then you'll be happy. And we're just driving and striving for happiness in all the wrong places. And, but the truth is, the American lifestyle isn't making us happy. In fact, it's making us sick. Americans spend $250 billion a year on prescription drugs. Antidepressants are the second most popular prescription in the United States after cholesterol medication. But according to the U.S. National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine, the pills aren't fixing the problem. In fact, Americans die younger and experience more injury and illness than people in, any, in uh, other rich nations, despite spending almost twice as much per person on health care. So let me sum all this not so good news up for you guys. This is in your notes. We are working more than ever before, right? I mean, we just are, and a lot of you are like, yeah, uh, amen, I get it. We're working more than ever before. We have more stuff than ever before, and we are sicker than ever before. That's the not so good news. Well, how about some good news? Yes. Not some good news? Yes, let's hear it. It doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> we can choose another way. And in fact, this commandment that we just read that's right smack dab in the middle of the Ten Commandments actually might just be what we need that will help us to live a more healthy and vibrant life and do incredible, allow the Lord to do incredible things in and through our lives. It doesn't have to be that way. We can choose another way. We can choose to embrace this commandment to observe the Sabbath day and by keeping it holy, Sabbath. Sabbath is slowing down. It's giving God one-seventh of your week. It's giving God one-seventh of your life. You're like, really? Like a one day a week, one-seventh of my year, one-seventh of my life? Yes, that's what it was intended for. It's not by accident that honoring the Sabbath is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are set up in two parts, just as Pastor Jeremy explained to us in his first, uh, first week of this series. The first part is about loving God. Those first four commandments, it's all about loving God. It's directed towards God, right? And then the last six commandments are all about loving others, loving our neighbor. And these two halves make up the whole of the spiritual life. All the law and the prophets hang on these two parts is what Jesus told us. And Sabbath, I believe, is the bridge that connects the two right in the middle. And if we will practice it the way God intended it, and actually recognize it for what it is, and begin to do those practices, it will have a ripple effect, and we'll see it as the gift that it is from God for our lives, for our families, for our marriages, for our relationship with the Lord. It will be an aha moment, and some of those statistics we saw will begin to, begin to change. I love what author and pastor John Mark Colmer said about Sabbath, and he, man, he, he's an incredible writer, uh, speaker, author, pastor, and uh, he's got a lot of great, incredible information on Sabbath and some of these other spiritual practices. So does uh, writers like Pete, Pete, uh, excuse me, Pete Scazzaro, um, love their stuff. 
But John Mark Comer said this, and I think it's a great working definition of Sabbath for this morning. He says, Sabbath is an entire day of your week. One seventh of your life set aside not only to stop and rest, but also delight in and worship the God who made you to be with himself. I love that, it's beautiful. And, and honestly, I'm standing in front of you as a pastor of over 20 plus years of church ministry, 45 years old, following the Lord since I was 13 years old, and, and uh, I didn't really grab a hold of the idea of what Sabbath truly really was until recently. And I wasn't very good at practicing it. And, uh, but man, it's a beautiful thing and it's a beautiful gift from God if we will practice it the way God intended it. So let's jump right in. I've got four practices of Sabbath that I wanna share with you this morning to help us understand it a little bit better. Number one, the practice, practice number one is stop. Everybody say stop. All right, in the original Hebrew language, Sabbath means Shabbat, which when you look at, look at it and it's translated, it's a verb that literally means stop, to stop, to cease from doing work, to cease from doing things and literally stop. So to stop is built into the literal meaning of this word for Sabbath. Yet most of us can't stop until we finish whatever it is that we feel and we think we just have to finish. We are just driven by hurry, by demand to do this and do that. We gotta complete this project, we gotta finish that term paper, um, we, we've gotta answer emails, we've gotta return all those phone calls, we've gotta complete balancing our accounts so we can pay bills, we've gotta finish cleaning the house, we gotta mow the yard. It, it just goes on and on and on. There's always one more goal to be reached before we can actually stop. And goals are great, but when they drive us to absolute exhaustion, and drive us away from the Lord, and in and, and a moment, in a time like Sabbath, then we've missed it. In your notes, it says this, by stopping for Sabbath, we recognize and we embrace our limits. Did you guys know that limits are actually a gift from the Lord? So sometimes that rubs against us the wrong way. We're like, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm a go-getter. Man, I just get things done, right? I wake up and, and, and I only sleep four hours a night, man, I just get stuff done. I don't care who you are, you have limits, physically, mentally, emotionally, in every way, and they're actually beautiful gifts from God if we'll see them that way, all right? Because here's the deal, God is God, amen? He is God, he is indispensable, he is the, the creator, and I am the creature, right, that he has created, I am his creation. The world continues working on just fine when I stop whether I think it does or not. And to be transparent with you this morning, I struggle with this a lot. Um, it's so difficult for me to slow down. Um, and really, I can even physically slow down, but it's a whole different ball game to slow this down, my mind, and my heart, and my emotions. Anybody else? Like I just, I can stop for physically, but man, my mind is just still going, worrying, filled with anxiety about this or about that, and I gotta get this done, I gotta get that done. What if this happens, what if that happens? And I just, you just ask my wife, <laughs> you ask my poor kids, they'll probably tell you that, that I am constantly doing something. There's always a project around the house that's gotta be done, inside, outside, doesn't matter. I just have this need to feel busy, and I'm not real sure where that comes from, to be transparent with you. Maybe it's just that feeling of accomplishment, um, dr driven by achievement, I don't know just wanting to, to, to make everybody happy and make sure I get all these things done. And then I'll look over at my wife, she's sitting right over here, and she'll be, she'll be reading a book, just chilling out. She'll be taking a nap, and, and at first I'm jealous, at first I'm kinda ticked off, you know, and then I realize, wait, I, it's okay to slow down. It's okay to just stop doing, right? We think maybe I will stop when it's a different season. Anybody ever said that before? I'm just, you know, Pastor Steven, I'm in a pretty busy season right now. It's just life, and uh, uh, maybe when my kids aren't so young, then I'll slip. No, you won't, trust me, because when they become teenagers, it gets even busier, I promise, uh, and we still feel like we can't stop. Or maybe it's, you, you, you feel like, oh, I'll stop when I have no, more money. I have goals, financial goals, and that's good. But you're like, man, when I have enough money, then I'll, then I'll slow down, then I'll stop. Or when we buy that first house, or maybe it's when I retire, I'll stop and I'll slow down. And the list goes on and on and on. We stop on Sabbath because God is on the throne. Did you catch that? He's on the throne, guys. 
It doesn't matter what's going on in our world today, in our country today, and a lot of it's not good, but we are reminded that he is still on the throne, assuring us that this world will not fall apart if we slow down and we stop for a 24-hour period. Life on this side of heaven is kind of like an unfinished uh, symphony. We accomplish one goal, and then immediately we're confronted with new opportunities and new challenges. But ultimately, we will pass from this life, all of us. And guess what? More than likely, there will be some goals, there will be some unfinished projects and goals that get left undone. And that's okay, because God is at work taking care of the universe, taking care of the world, he manages quite well without you and I running things, amen? And so when we're sleeping, he is working. And so he commands us to relax, to enjoy the fact that we're not in charge of this world, that even when we die and pass on from this life, the world will continue on nicely without us. It reminds us of Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. As we practice Sabbath, it's this idea that be still and know that I am God. How are we supposed to know that he is God and hear his voice if we don't stop and slow down and be still and allow him to speak? God, forgive us for being so hurried and rushing so fast through this life that we don't stop and be still before you. It also reminds us Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 33. So don't worry about these things. He's telling us, don't worry. Anybody else worry about a lot of things and have anxiety? He says, don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate our thoughts. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. So if he knows all of our needs, then we can stop. We can slow down. So seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. We don't need to worry. We can't stop and slow down. Really, the core issue here is trust. We don't trust God. We say it with lip service. We sing about it. We read about it. We may say it, but do our actions really say that we trust God? Will God take care of us and our concerns if we obey him by stopping and practicing Sabbath? It reminds me of an old story of a a group, a wagon train group of families and individuals that were moving west. They were leaving, they were going from St. Louis all the way to Oregon. That whole picture of the 1800s wagon train moving west to a new life and a new adventure. And they observed along the way, this group of people, they observed the Sabbath. In other words, they they would move west for six days and on that seventh day, they would take the entire day and they would stop and they would, they would cease doing anything else. Well, as, as, as they were going through autumn, going through the fall months, and as winter approached, they began to get a little bit scared. They began to panic a little bit and get in fear because they thought, well, man, if we, if we don't get there before winter, the snow's gonna begin and that could be fatal for us. And so a number of these, the members of these groups, they proposed the idea that maybe they should quit do, you know, stopping on the Sabbath. Maybe they should just every single day just keep driving west until they hit Oregon. And this caused an argument among the group. And uh, they ended up being divided on what the group should do. And so they divided into two groups. One group would have continued to observe the Sabbath day. And uh, they would rest on that one day. And all the other six days, they would just travel. And then the other group was just going to press on seven days at a time, just nonstop, keep trying to get to Oregon. Well, which group arrived to Oregon first? Of course, the ones who kept the Sabbath, believe it or not. Both the people and their horses were so rested by the the time that they would spend on that Sabbath day observance that they could travel much more efficiently and quicker the other six days. Isn't that awesome? See, when I trust God and when you trust God and and obey his commands, he always provides for us. Jesus takes the loaves and the fishes that we offer him like that little boy in the New Testament. And even though it seems insufficient to feed the multitudes, Somehow he miraculously makes it and turns it into more. We can trust him enough to stop. That's number one. Number two, practice number two, is rest. Once we stop, then the Sabbath calls us to rest. God rested, right? We see this example. He rested after his work, and we're to do the same every seventh day. 
Genesis chapter two, at the beginning of God's word, uh, verses one through three, it says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, and so he what? He rested from all his work. Did he rest because he was exhausted? No, he's God. He did it because he was setting an example for us. And God blessed the seventh day. He declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. And so now that we are stopping for a day to practice Sabbath, now what do we do, right? Well, the answer simply is whatever delights and replenishes you, whatever is restful to you. Anybody like that? I'm, I'm okay with that. This part's easy. So now, now that you're stopping for a day, what do you do? Well, that may include napping, right? I think some of those, one of the most spiritual things that some of us can do is go take a nap. <laughs> I really do, you know? It could be napping, it could be working out. Now some of you, you're like, no man, that, that, does not, that sounds like work to me, I do not wanna work out. But for some of you, that is restful, go for it. Uh, not me. Uh, going on long walks, right? Uh, reading a book, watching a good movie, going out for dinner. Uh, whatever you know, allows you to truly rest, that is rest. For me to enjoy Sabbath rest, however, requires that I have another day of the week to do all those tasks of life that just consume my energy beyond even my, my, my work, right? It's the stuff we do that can fill us with worry. Uh, for example, paying bills, right? Uh, that is not restful to me. Um, working on a budget, right? Not restful. Cleaning the house, mowing the yard, doing loads of laundry, right? These are things that need to be done at another time during the week, why? So you can really, truly stop and rest. Once we begin the practice of Sabbath and truly rest, we begin to get a different mindset where we realize we work the other six days from a place of rest. It's not the other way around, where we work six days really, really hard and, and, and we reach the finish line just wiped out and we crash, exhausted. No, it's not meant to be that way. When we truly practice Sabbath, we're working from a place of rest, not just trying to get to the end of the week so we just crash and not give God that day. And so we need to understand true Sabbath, or true, true Sabbath, excuse me, Sabbath rest takes intentionality. And in our world today, that is so hard because we live in an anti-rest world. It's a radical idea, a counter-cultural idea to rest. So we have to be intentional to say no to some things that we like, some things that we're used to. And here's a few things that we may have to say no to. You ready for this? Brace yourself. You may have to say no to your phone, right? Some of you are like, praise the Lord. I'd love to just throw my phone out the window. Some of you, you can't imagine life without it. We, we have slowly been trying to implement Sabbath at our house. We're not perfect at it by any means, but I'll never forget a few weeks ago, I'm looking at my kids over here and my two oldest have phones, and I said, hey, I've got a basket. We're gonna put our phones in a basket for 24 hours, and the look on their face was like, what? You're, you're crazy. What are, you, what are you saying? We're gonna put our, I mean, how am I supposed to do this, and how am I gonna do, I was like, it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be okay, you're gonna survive. Everything's, the world's gonna go on without your, you know, you having your phone, and, and the next day, they were kinda like, you know what, that wasn't so bad. But it, it may be your phone. In fact, I encourage you to put your phone away for 24 hours. Maybe it's, you know, not maybe, but it should be social media. No social media for 24 hours. Just getting off of that for 24 hours to really stop and to rest. It could be TV and entertainment. If that's, not, uh, if that's drawing you away and isolating you and not allowing you to be with family, then maybe that needs to stop. We could go on and on with lots of examples. But when we stop and we rest, we respect the image of God in us. We are nonstop human beings, aren't we? And sadly, it often takes a physical illness to get us to even rest. We don't serve the Sabbath, the Sabbath serves us. So that's number two. Practice number three is delight. Now that we stop and we rest, now we can delight in what we have been given, right? Genesis chapter one, verse 31, then God looked over all that he had made. This is the creation, right? He had spent the six days creating everything, and he, he says what? And he saw that it was good. I love that. He delighted. He delighted over his creation. The word delight communicates a sense of joy. It communicates a sense of completion. It communicates wonder. It even communicates play, actually. 
right? And this is a radical idea in today's culture, isn't it? I mean, we watch the news for just 60 seconds, and all you hear is the opposite of delight. Our world and our culture right now is delight deficient. Not to mention that uh, the way pleasure and delight has been so distorted by our culture, many of us as followers of Jesus struggle with even receiving joy and pleasure. But on Sabbath, we're called to enjoy and delight in creation and its gifts. So we're to slow down, pay attention to the things that on most days we just rush right past, not even noticing them, much less delighting in them. When was the last time you paid attention to the food you were eating? Huh? You're sitting at Pelican Point, and you're like, man, that smells good. Man, that tastes good. How many of us do that? And that may sound a little bit silly, but really, do we ever just slow down to enjoy the little things that we've been blessed with that God's given us, right? When was the last time you slowed down to take a, a long walk or a hike and see the beauty around you? Looking up and looking at the beautiful blue sky, uh, taking in all the trees, the beauty of the trees and the flowers around you. These beautiful things that were created with great care by God. He's given us the ability to see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. That we might actually take delight in all of our senses and all the miraculous things that he has created. This is in your notes as well. On Sabbath, God also invites us to slow down and pay attention and delight in people, in the people in our lives. In the Gospels, we see Jesus doing this so well. He models it so well for us, whether it was the, the Samaritan woman at the well, the rich young ruler, Nicodemus, he modeled this so well. He seemed to fully engage in the delight of being present with men and women crafted in God's image. And I tell you what, for me personally, one of the most important pieces of Sabbath is how it creates a space for me to slow down and delight in my wife and my kids. And sometimes I'll be honest, I can be present in the room, but mentally, emotionally, I'm not. I'm somewhere else, I'm thinking about this or that. And Sabbath reminds me to slow down and delight in these beautiful people that he's put in my life. We're, we're like anyone else, we're like any other family. We're busy, we're too busy most of the time. And I'm more aware of this than ever before with my, my oldest daughter, Natalie, graduating high school just a couple weeks ago. We're getting ready to, to drive, her down, or drive her over to Florida, 14 hours away uh, here in a couple months, and drop her off at college uh, as she begins that next chapter of her life. Oh God, help us to slow down and to be with our loved ones and take delight in our families and our, the friends that God has put in our life, those life-giving friends, the family that he's put around us. Then, Sabbath delight invites us to healthy play as well. The word chosen in Greek literally means dancing around. I just love that idea. Creation and life are, in a sense, God's gift to us uh, as a playground around us. Whether, it was through, whether it's through sports or dance or games or visiting places like museums or national parks, uh, nurturing this sense of pure fun in God also is part of delighting in Sabbath and delighting in who he is and what he's done for us. Y'all still with me? All right, practice number four, the final practice, and honestly the most important, is worship. It's worship. You may be thinking today, okay, Pastor Stephen, I, I like this idea of stopping. That sounds great. I love the idea of resting and going and taking a nap. Um, you know, this delighting thing, that sounds great, but worship, what is that supposed to look like? I mean, are we supposed to just sing all day long? Are we supposed to sit around and sing Kumbaya as a family for 24 hours? Like, what's going on? What are we supposed to do exactly by worshiping for 24 hours? And for many years, I'll be honest, my understanding of Sabbath simply meant a typical American Sunday with church attendance. Anybody else? Like, that's, I, I grew up in church, and it was just what you do. Sunday was that day of worship, that day of the Lord, we'd call it, and just... We would go to church, we'd attend church, we'd check off that box, and then maybe have lunch with our family that afternoon, but the rest of the day was just spent doing other stuff, you know? Maybe it was watching football, and again, that's not bad, let's not be legalistic, but there really wasn't a lot of worship going on. There wasn't a lot of time spent taking moments to really truly worship the Lord. There were elements of Sabbath, but really it was more like a Christianized day off where church attendance 
becomes just another thing that we do on the weekend. Sabbath is meant to be a day where we take intentional time to contemplate the Lord, right? Worship, contemplate, kind of the same thing. Just contemplating on who he is, what he means to us, and what he's done for us. How often do we slow down to, to really do that and to worship him and all that he has done? The ultimate aim of Sabbath is to worship him, right? In Genesis, again, I read this earlier, but let me read it again. Genesis 2, 2 through 3. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day, and he what? He declared it holy. And holy here means set apart, special, set apart, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. The first time in the Bible that we see the word holy is right there. So what he made holy was an entire day. Sabbath is a day set apart and dedicated to God. And don't miss this part. It is not a reward. It is worship. It's not meant to be a reward. It's meant to be worship. Stopping, resting, delighting. The first three things I talked about are really great and they help add to the worship. But without worship, they are incomplete. And Sabbath simply becomes a day off. It becomes a me day. It's just a day off, a reward for working hard all the six days before. Not that that's a bad thing, but if we miss out on the worship piece, we're missing the whole thing. But when worship is the focus, we then truly practice Sabbath the way that it was intended. We then work from our rest the other six days. We begin looking forward to Sabbath, not just because we get to take a nap, no, because we know that the week begins with Sabbath. It doesn't end with Sabbath as a reward. It starts the week off with me worshiping God and giving him the attention that he so deserves. It also helps me give him better attention the other six days because I started the week with Sabbath and focused on worshiping my heavenly Father. Again, Sabbath is a day set aside and dedicated to God and that is really what worship is. We tend to think of worship as just the music at the beginning of a service like this morning, which is beautiful and a big part of worship, but that, that's not the only expression of worship, right? Worship is so much more than just that. Worship on Sabbath is taking time to read the scriptures individually or as a family and as a family taking time to pray individually and as a family. It also includes some practices that we neglect or have never even thought much about, like taking times and moments of silence and solitude, where we get alone with no distractions, quiet ourselves, relax, and we quit telling the Lord all the things that we need and all the things that are wrong, and we actually sit in silence and let him speak to us. Because guess what? Stephen Courtney, even though he's a pastor, I still need discipled. I still need to hear the Lord's voice. I still need him, I still need to know the goodness of the Lord and hear him speak and hear about the, the parts of me that I need to keep working on and surrendering to him. And that's only gonna happen when I get in the stillness and the silence before the Lord. You would be amazed at what God can do when we offer him our full attention in a time and a space of solitude and silence. And Sabbath provides that when we're intentional with it. That is worship. So, to finish up today, I've just got a few quick tips that I wanna give you as we close our time together today for, for getting into Sabbath and practicing Sabbath. You might feel a little overwhelmed when you, maybe you're hearing this for the first time, and you're like, how am I gonna do this for a 24-hour period? Well, let me say this, start small. That's my first tip to you, just start small. I don't wanna be inconsiderate of those of you in the room that you're like, man, I don't, I don't, even, I don't even get a day off. I literally work seven days a week. There's probably some of you in the room that do. You're like, I can't even take an entire day off. But would you start small and just ask the Lord, say, God, help me find an hour or two hours or three somewhere in my week that I can just dedicate to you to stop, to rest, to delight, and to just worship you and give you my full focus. Just start small. Don't only start small, but start where you are, not where you should be. There's no condemnation here. I'm still trying to figure this out myself and practice this better in my life. 
Start where you are, not where you should be. Right? Just start somewhere. But start and keep adding at it. Because I'm telling you, once you add to it and you make this a regular practice in your life, the ripple effect of this, the gift that Sabbath is, will be such a blessing to you and those around you. And then finally, give yourself and your loved ones some grace as you try to figure this out. Uh, you know, we, we tried this the first time not too long ago, and I had this beautiful idea of how this was gonna look. We put the phones in the basket, and I remember the next morning, I thought, we're gonna cook together breakfast. It's gonna be beautiful, right? So we're gonna make all this big breakfast, and my kids are gonna be smiling and just so ready to hear Dad with his Bible at the breakfast table. It did not go that way at all, and I was ready to quit. I was like, I looked at my wife, and I'm like, I, I quit, I give up, and she's looked at me, she's like, really? Like, we've been talking about this and you're just gonna give up that easy. I was like, no, you're right, you're always right. And um, so give yourself grace, give your loved ones grace as you begin to step into this and begin to operate in these practices because they're, they're so worth it, amen? Well guys, can you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? I wanna pray for all of us. But before I pray for all of us in this idea of Sabbath, while your eyes are closed and heads are bowed, First and foremost, for us to practice Sabbath and this beautiful gift of Sabbath, we've got to understand the most important gift is Jesus and a relationship with Jesus. And maybe there's some of us here today who have never really made a commitment to follow Jesus and surrender our lives to him. Or maybe you did years ago, but you've kind of walked away from that relationship and you are considering restarting that relationship. At the end of the day, it's about us being on the throne of our lives and not allowing God to be on the throne of our lives. And so before we can practice Sabbath and truly worship this God is to, is to have a relationship with him. And I wanna pray for you this morning with every eye closed and every head bowed. If you're here this morning and you would love for us to pray for you and pray over you, would you be brave enough to just raise your hand so I can pray for you this morning? Thank you guys, awesome. Thank you for raising your hand. And as you're sitting there this morning, just repeat this prayer with me. Agree with me in this prayer as I pray over you. God, we love you and we just thank you for this beautiful ancient practice of Sabbath, Lord, that a lot of times we've just forgotten or neglected or didn't really understand. But God, it starts with a relationship with you. And I pray for those this morning that have raised their hands for salvation that want to begin and start a relationship with you or maybe restart a relationship with you for the first time in a long time. God, we recognize that we're sinners. God, just as we're sitting there this morning, I, I just pray that all of us would admit that. Say, God, we're sinners. We're sinners. We're all uh, imperfect, Lord God, and we need a Savior. We need you, and we are thankful for what you did for us on the cross. Thank you for dying for us and forgiving us of our sins. God, would you come into our lives and rule and reign on the throne of our life so that we might begin following you and trusting you with everything we are. Because as I said earlier about stopping, it's really down to trust. God, that we might, all of us in this room, begin to start the practices of Sabbath and that it might change us from the inside out. God, that we would trust you and follow you with everything that we have, everything that we are. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.